With the rise of the BA2 variant in some parts of the country, many questions remain about how to best navigate daily life and what precautions should or shouldn't be taken. To answer some of those questions for us, I'm joined by White House COVID response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha. Dr. Jha, welcome back to the News Hour. Always good to see you, and thank you for braving those reins to stand out and talk to us tonight. Um, we should note that cases have been ticking up, um, and the graph we're about to show people here, I know you cannot see, actually shows back from October of 2020 one to today. We are nowhere near the Omicron peak, we should point out, but there are a number of new cases. 33,000 just reported yesterday. What is fueling that uptick? Is it the rolling back of some of the mask mandates? Yes, yeah, so Amna, thanks for having me back. Um, I think the major issue driving these uh, increases in cases is BA2. Uh, this subvariant is even more contagious than the original Omic Omicron, and we saw it fuel case increases across Europe, in Israel, and elsewhere. And I think that is the major reason we're seeing it happening in the U.S. right now. We also know that at-home testing is being used a lot more than it used to be, but often people don't report those results. Could these case counts actually be higher than we know? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I'm a huge fan of home tests, right? I think they're great, but that does lead to some undercounting. Um, but there are other ways that we're monitoring what's going on, right? Looking at wastewater data, looking at hospitalizations. There are other metrics we can use so that we have a sense of how much infection there is in the community. So let me ask you about masking, because there is some confusion around this the longer the pandemic goes on. You have said very clearly, as have many officials, masking is an important tool to prevent spread. But when you look at the CDC guidelines online, they only recommend masking in areas of what they call high community spread. So if you log on and you look at the map, the vast majority of the country is green. It is low community spread. For anyone who looks at that map and says, oh, this is fine, I'm in a safe area, I don't need to mask, what would you say? Yeah, so first of all, I think from a historical basis, we are at low infection levels, right? Like, yes, it is true they've gone up, but they're still very, very low. And, and, and hospitalizations right now actually are at the lowest point in the pandemic. So uh, I don't think that, uh, I, I think that, you know, choosing not to mask up right now is reasonable. Um, obviously, if you're in a high risk setting, obviously, if you're a high risk person, uh, in those contexts, wearing a mask is always reasonable and people may make that decision. I think CDC is laying out a broad framework for how to think about it for the broader public. Well, given all of that, then help us understand why the extension of the mask mandate on in transportation. If people are on planes and trains and buses and masking, but then take those masks off the minute they go out to restaurants or schools or stores, what's the impact it's actually having? Yeah, so I, I think the CDC decision to wait 15 days to make a more durable decision on masking on planes and transportation is very reasonable, and here's why. Uh, BA2, the variant that we've been talking about, just became dominant over the last couple of weeks. Um, whether it's going to cause a larger increase and whether it's going to cause uh, substantial increases in hospitalizations and deaths, we don't think so, but we don't know for sure. And what CDC scientists are saying is 15 more days would give us actually a lot more data on that. And that will allow us to make a more data-driven, informed decision. It feels really reasonable to me to make that, uh, to take that 15 days and make a better decision. To be clear, you don't know for sure yet if BA2 could lead to more hospitalizations, but you think within the next couple of weeks you will know that. We'll have a lot more information, yes. Yeah. So I think in the, within the next couple of weeks, you know, once something becomes dominant, usually about a week or 10 days later, uh, you start getting a pretty good sense of what's happening with hospitalization. Certainly by two weeks, I think we'll have a much clearer picture. So let me ask you about vaccines then as well, because we reported earlier in the show, of course, Pfizer is seeking that approval for booster shots for younger kids. Um, but they have authorized the second booster, which is effectively the fourth shot for people 50 and older and those who are immunocompromised. There seems to be some debate even in the scientific community about how necessary, how effective that fourth shot really is. So what do you say to that? Yeah, the best data we have on the fourth shot is from Israel. And the data is actually, I think, quite clear. People over 60 uh, who got a fourth shot had dramatic reductions, not just in infections, which of course matter, uh, but in, in hospitalizations and deaths, which is the thing we care most about. So I feel like that based on the data, people over 60 who are four or five months out of their second shot, I mean, out of their third shot, uh, should get that second booster. I think that second booster is going to be protective. 50 to 59, the data is less clear. If you're a higher risk, it makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, and I think they should, people with 50 to 59 should consider it. But to me, 60 and over, if you're going to follow the Israeli data, 
uh, it's, it's clear people clearly benefit from that second booster. So following the data with younger kids in particular and following what we've seen across the country, there are very few younger children in America who are fully vaccinated in that age group 5 to 11. It's still about 28 percent of that population. They are back in school. Masks are coming off. We have not seen huge outbreaks. You, have, you yourself have said we don't have a reason to be excessively concerned. So what's the argument to make to parents that they should get their kids vaccinated in the first place, much less boosted? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I have a, I have a 10 year old and I got him vaccinated the first day he was eligible. Uh, and the question is why? And it's really straightforward, right? Because we know these vaccines are exceedingly safe. Uh, and while infection numbers are low right now, they might rise again. They have been obviously higher in the past. And protecting our kids against it uh, with a very, very safe vaccine to me is a no brainer. Uh, and that's why I have been very strong proponent of getting kids uh, five and above uh, vaccinated. Because the evidence is, uh, that the benefit is is substantial and the risks are very, very small. But to be clear, you are asking or you're suggesting it, recommending it based on a potential future variant because we haven't seen that uptick in hospitalization so far, correct? Yeah, I am saying, first of all, that even when kids get infected, I mean, if you have a very safe, effective vaccine that uh, prevents infection, uh, kids should get vaccinated uh, against that uh, against that virus. And yes, it's true we have not seen an uptick, but kids continue to get infected from this virus. Obviously, some proportion of them uh, still do get hospitalized. And if you have something that's very safe and effective that can prevent that, uh, I strongly recommend to parents that they get it. So we know cases are going up. We know the virus is circulating. I can remember conversations between you and I with other experts over the last two years. You have said very clearly the more the virus moves, the more the potential, the greater the potential it could mutate, and we don't know what could happen next. So how worried are you about another potentially more dangerous variant? Yeah, you know, we're two years into this pandemic. We have seen a new variant that has caused substantial disruptions about every six months. Um, I remain worried about that. And the best way to prevent that obviously is to get as many people vaccinated and boosted in the United States, but it's also to vaccinate people globally. I mean, there is no question about it that if we let this, uh, this virus run rampant across the world, uh, it is just risking more variants and those variants end, end up eventually coming back to the United States. So we really need a global strategy here and we need to make sure we're vaccinating the entire world uh, while continuing to focus on vaccinating Americans. In just a few seconds we have left, you have a huge portfolio now in running the White House COVID response. What would you say at this point in the pandemic is the overall goal? Is it to try to actually prevent spread or just to keep people out of the hospital? I think it's both. I think we should be doing things that are sensible, reasonable to keep infection numbers low, right? We should be encouraging people to uh, get a test before they gather in large groups. We should encourage people, if you're going into a high-risk situation, um, you should think about it. If you have symptoms, you should stay home. I and mean, there's a lot we can do to reduce spread. That said, obviously we care about hospitalizations and deaths uh, a lot, and that means getting people vaccinated, boosted, getting people therapies that are becoming widely available. I don't think we have to trade off between cases and, uh, and severe disease. Uh, we can do both using different set of tools for different goals. That is White House COVID response coordinator, Dr. Ashish Jha, joining us tonight from the White House. Thank you so much, Dr. Jha. Good to see you. Thank you.